Hi. Here at Truth Seekers, uh, we tend to teach on a lot of subjects that are kind of out there as far as what the normal uh, traditional church would teach on. Uh, subjects like the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt, uh, Stonehenge, the Gospel Message in the Stars in Atlantis. Uh, these things tend to fly in the face of, of traditions and you're not going to see these subjects taught on most any uh, other uh, traditional church. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is the basis for faith for any Christian. Uh, and that is the resurrection of Christ. Uh, Paul says, if Christ be not raised, our faith is vain. So the resurrection message is very important. Every Christian needs to look at this. Every Christian needs to study it. Uh, professing Christian, if you're a professing Christian, then you need to look at the evidence. You need to uh, pull these facts into your uh, to your overall uh, theology, so that you can turn around and teach the resurrection to other people uh, in a manner that's that's believable. Um, this particular uh, study, the format, uh, is not mine. It is, uh, has been taught uh, every year, actually multiple times a year with the reruns. Uh, Dr. Gene Scott taught this, uh, and his overall format is what I'll be using. Uh, I've been learning him since, uh, from him since the early 80s uh, until his death in 05. Uh, I still listen to him regularly. And I'm learning from him all the time. He is my, my domata. He's, he's, uh, he's my teacher. And he'll be that way uh, until the day I die. I haven't found any other teacher or domata uh, that I could say is, is truly mine. Not since I've, I've uh, learned from Scott. And so uh, now, the majority of this message will be in my own words, but the overall format is his. And what I want you to do is, is to write down uh, the, uh, the things as I'm presenting them to you. There's a, uh, a particular uh, format uh, that's fairly easy to remember. And as I, I pull up the, the sentences, I'll, I'll show them on the screen. I want you to write them down. Because as you write these, these things down, you'll be able then uh, to turn around and teach the resurrection to someone else. Uh, now, most Christians have never taken the time to study this subject. Uh, if you're like me, I grew up in the church uh, as early, uh, at an early age, uh, straight away from it for a, a while. Uh, but God yanked me back pretty intensely. But... Uh, Most Christians haven't ever taken the time, taken the time to, uh, to look at the evidence that we have uh, for Christ's, uh, Jesus' resurrection. Um, but if it is, in fact, a, a fact of history and not just some fairy tale, then it is by far the uh, most important and significant event in the history of the world. It's so significant... Uh, in fact, that it is the central focus of the Great Pyramid of Giza, the lessons we learn there, and the, the lessons we learn in the Gospel Message in the Stars. Uh, Jesus and uh, his, his death uh, and resurrection as a sacrifice for the sins of the world uh, and his ascension back to God, this is the first message that was preached. Um, so, is it very, very important for Christians now. Uh, the Bible teaches us that we should always be ready to give an account uh, of why we believe, a testimony of why we believe. Um, and that's what this message does. This message gives you uh, reasons to believe. And this is, this is, uh, this particular message is why I can teach on the Great Pyramid. It's why I can teach on the Gospel and the Stars and Stonehenge and Atlantis uh, with a faith that's un uh, unending. It's, I know in whom I believe. I know that Jesus raised from the dead. 
Um, and that's something that once you have that spirit of Christ in you, you can say things like that. You can say, uh, you asking how he knows he lives, he lives within my heart. Uh, or you can say, um, uh, the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a son of God. Uh, and these things mean to mean something dear uh, to those who have that spirit implant uh, within them. However, these things mean nothing to a secular world, to unbelievers, to those who um, who may have been called but haven't been uh, given uh, given themselves over to this call. Uh, so this message is very important, and uh, I I want you to. Uh, to write this down so that you can turn around and teach others. It's very simple. Um, <clears throat> there's only one real reason to follow any God, uh, if he's truly God, uh, and that is the, the promise of eternal life. Uh, if you're not promised eternal life and it can't be, you can't stand in faith on that promise uh, by evidence that you've looked at and, and you've determined in your own spirit the truth of it all, uh, if we don't have eternity promised to us, what's the big deal? Uh, I mean, if you're if you're um, if you don't believe in the resurrection of Christ, then why the hell are you a Christian? You know, don't don't even go there. Just live your life, uh, get rich, step on whoever you want to, get to the top, uh, live your life and die because that's uh, that's all you you're gonna get. Uh, but if the resurrection proves to be true. Uh, then that is the, like I said, the single most important event of the Earth's history. And uh, it is the base, uh, basic reason for every Christian to be a Christian. And that is a belief in uh, the resurrection of Christ. And if he's raised from the dead, then we can be sure that God will raise us up as well. And we can live uh, uh, eternally with, with our Lord. Now... <clears throat> Many uh, scholars these days and unbelievers um, will say that the uh, Gospels weren't written by the authors, that uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was written by someone else hundreds of years later, and they just put their name on these books in order to give uh, some authenticity to their writing. Uh, however, through current archaeology and discoveries we found, uh, that uh, no longer flies. Uh, there's a seventh cave at Qumran uh, in where a fragment of Matthew written in Hebrew letters uh, was found. And this particular fragment dates back into the 60s, 60 AD. Uh, now, we also know that Mark was written first. Mark was written... Uh, First, and then Matthew and Luke both quote from Mark uh, in their Gospels. We can tell that by, by the quotes and, and, and uh, the phrases that they use. Uh, it's also known that all three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are quoting uh, from an, uh, a hitherto unknown source, which is called the hypothetical Q document. Uh, Q, from the uh, German word quell, Q-U-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, meaning source, uh, and this particular uh, Q document, hypothetical Q document, has never been found, uh, yet they know for sure that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all quote from this uh, unknown document. Now, it's speculated that Matthew wrote down the sayings of Jesus as he followed him, and this is what comprises the hypothetical Q document. Uh, that's speculation, but it's a very good one because um, it uh, it makes sense because Matthew was uh, a tax collector and uh, he was uh, versed in the, the languages of the day very well. He uh, would have been a good choice for one to write down all the sayings of Jesus. Uh, but now if, if, if we found a, a, a fragment of Matthew dating back to in the 60s of A.D., we know that Mark was dated uh, probably some 20 years even before that. So that pushes it back to some maybe 20 some years after the, the death of Christ when Mark was written. Uh, so the, uh, the theory 
that these original gospels uh, were not written by uh, their namesakes, the the who the books are named after, uh, is out the window. That's uh, that's no longer a valid assumption. Now, uh, what um, what we need to, to look at is uh, the what uh, scholars these days will also say is they will take Jesus. Uh, if you're going into college uh, and you believe in miracles, or if you believe in the resurrection of Christ. Uh, scholars will, will uh, kind of portray you as less than intelligent uh, for believing in such things. Uh, and that's, uh, that don't need to be the case, though. Uh, what they want to do with Jesus is because they don't believe in miracles, they don't believe in the resurrection, they don't believe in prophecy, uh, they want to put him in the, the box of all the, the modern uh, founders of, of religion, uh, and claim that he's just a good and wise teacher. Uh, and we'll find out shortly how that cannot be the case. Uh, but what I want to do is, is go over these uh, founders of modern religions first uh, and, and show to you that uh, they never claimed anything like Jesus did. Now, Muhammad was a prophet of, of God, or Allah, and he only claimed visions of eternity from Allah. Uh, Confucius uh, did a logical analysis of society. And so he, he was trying to solve the problems of this world and life. When they asked him about eternity, uh, he said that he couldn't figure out this world, so why ask him about the next? The uh, Gautama Buddha uh, sought a way to escape Tanya. Tanya, which may, basically means thirsts, or it's the, um, uh, the worldly lusts and desires of this world. He sought a way to escape that and escape karma. Uh, and in doing so, he <clears throat> went through to the extremes. On one end, he, he uh, went through and, and just indulged in all kind of sensual things. He did everything he could. It's kind of like Solomon uh, just going out and... and doing whatever he could uh, just to, to uh, figure out uh, what was on. But Buddha did this to, to try and dull his senses to these desires, these thirsts uh, of worldly things. Uh, so he just uh, would, would do anything. He would, he would do any kind of sin. He would indulge in any kind of sensual activity uh, as much as he could in order to dull his senses, but that didn't work. So then he went the other way. He tried uh, abstinence from all worldly pleasures, even speech. He would he would uh, uh, couldn't even talk. Uh, and then he figured out, well, that's not going to work either, because he still had these these thirsts, these these lusts of of worldly things. Uh, and he reached what was called the middle way, uh, an eightfold path of spiritual meditation that allowed him to reach uh, their uh, nirvana, which is the, the that beyond all that, is how they would term it. It's um, uh, the ultimate reality. Uh, and he only advised his followers that this path worked for him. And it might work for them as well. He told his followers that he, Buddha, was, wasn't worthy of leading them, that his death means nothing, that he was nothing. Now... Uh, Scholars these days in, in colleges mainly will, will tell you that Jesus should be put into the category of these uh, founders of modern religions uh, as just a good and wise teacher. Uh, now, none of these uh, founders ever claimed any kind of divinity. They never claimed uh, anything beyond just either visions of God from Muhammad and you know, Confucius trying to solve the uh, problems of society and, and Buddha seeking a way to escape Tanya uh, never claimed any kind of divinity or any kind of uh, special uh, that their life meant anything uh, special uh, it was only bestowed on them hundreds of years later by their followers and you can determine 
exactly when it happened and when their followers uh, stamped a an air of divinity on them. Uh, but uh, this cannot be said about Jesus. Jesus boldly claimed his divinity, leaving no, no doubt of his intent. Now you could find uh, the tombs for Muhammad and Confucius and Buddha, but not Jesus' tomb. There are two locations now that uh, are speculated uh, as Jesus' tomb, one with the big churches on it and the other at uh, uh, Gordon's tomb. And no one knows because in the early centuries, uh, after Jesus raised from the dead, they didn't care. He wasn't in the tomb, so they didn't care about tomb. It was only later years when relics became uh, desired that they started looking for this tomb. And, and chances are Gordon's tomb is probably the most likely uh, place where would be the actual tomb because it sits uh, in, a, in a garden area. Uh, close to a rock outcropping. It looks kind of like a shape of a skull, which was probably Golgotha. Uh, but the tomb didn't matter any, any longer when, when Jesus raised from the dead, so they didn't care about it, and it was lost to, uh, to the knowledge of where it was. Now, um, if you want to have a logical explanation of the resurrection of Jesus there are some facts that you need to uh, need to assume uh, just for instance if if you want to discuss whether Jesus came out of the tomb you have to uh, you have to believe that he lived so so this, there are several things on the list here and I want you to write these down we'll talk about each one but the first one is Jesus lived. Now, uh, the fact that Jesus lived is no longer really questioned by scholars. There are secular sources, um, quotes and um, writings from uh, people of his day, Tiberius Caesar and Pilate, uh, indicating that, that Jesus was there, that he lived, that he was crucified and that he did miracles, uh, at least in their mind they did. Um, so the fact that Jesus lived uh, is no longer really in question, but you have to assume that uh, in order to be able to discuss whether or not he raised from the dead. It's like uh, someone saying, well, have you, uh, did you see what Patrick said today? The guy's crazy. He talks about the pyramid and stuff. Well, you know, you have to assume that I lived in order for me to be able to speak something. So that's the kind of uh, uh, things that we're talking about here. Now, the next one that we need to assume is that he was crucified, which was instigated by the Jewish leaders at the hands of the Romans. <clears throat> this is supported by scripture. Uh, and, but in order to discuss whether or not he raised from the dead, we need to assume that he was crucified, uh, instigated by the Jewish leaders, which is what the Bible says, and at the hands of the Romans. Uh, number three, he was considered dead. People don't just live through a Roman crucifixion, uh, especially uh, considering the fact that they pierced his side with a spear. Now, this is not saying he was for sure dead, this, but he was considered dead. Uh, and we'll get into the other details about that in a minute. Uh, number four, that you have to assume in order to have a logical discussion of the resurrection, you have to assume that he was buried in a known accessible tomb. This is also supported by scripture, uh, for they put a, a guard over the tomb. And uh, so we have to, to assume that it was an unknown and accessible tomb. It was Joseph of Arimathea's uh, own tomb that he put him in, 
uh, who was uh, the uncle. Now, number five, we have to assume that he was preached, raised from the dead, that the tomb was empty, and that he ascended to heaven. Now, this was their first message. Their first message was that the tomb was empty, Jesus had raised from the dead, and that he ascended back to heaven. So we need to, to assume that, uh, that he was preached this in order to discuss his resurrection. <clears throat> Number six. The Jewish leaders had a lot at stake disproving the resurrection. The Jewish leaders hated Jesus. They sought ways to, to catch, him, catch him many times. Uh, constantly saying that he was uh, blaspheming by the things he did and said. Uh, and if Jesus raised from the dead, this is their livelihood. This is their job. They, they had a lot to, to uh, at stake to disprove a, his resurrection. So that has to be assumed. Number seven, the disciples were horribly persecuted. Uh, this is uh, stated also in scripture and it's proven by history that they were all horribly uh, persecuted and suffered martyrs' deaths all save John. And last, we have to assume that the tomb was actually empty. These are things you have to assume to have a logical discussion of the resurrection of Christ with anyone. Now, so talking a little bit about these things, <clears throat> both biblical and secular Jewish records tell of uh, Jesus' persecution by the Jewish leaders and him being uh, crucified by the Romans. Uh, the Romans had posted a guard at the tomb, so it was accessible. Uh, the first message preached told of his empty tomb, his resurrection, and his ascension back to heaven. The very first message preached uh, entailed those three things. Uh, and uh, to the leaders, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, their entire livelihood depended on uh, proving the resurrection as false um, because it was their livelihood. They would be out of a job. If Jesus raised from the dead, they're out of a job. Uh, had the Jews accepted Christ and not crucified him, Jesus could have uh, been their king, but then uh, his death wouldn't have saved the world. Now, um, And if the tomb uh, hadn't been empty, if, if he was in the tomb, then uh, Christianity wouldn't exist. But the Romans and the Jewish leaders needed to, to disprove those claims. Now, to also discuss whether uh, Jesus... Uh, raised from the dead or not. Let's talk first about what Jesus actually had to say about himself. Number one, like I said, write these down. Jesus thought he was perfect. He called the Pharisees and Sadducees whited sepulchers saying they strain out a gnat, swallow a camel. He sought to change the laws of Moses. He said, you've heard it say unto you, but behold, I say. Um, and then he said, self-righteously, he said, think not that I've come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Every time he speaks, he speaks as though he thought he was perfect. Um, number two. Jesus thought that all authority is in himself. 
He would say things like, you, you build on what I say, you build on a rock. You build on anything else, you build on sand. Um, and things like, all authority in heaven is, and, and earth is given unto me. Um, so he, he seats all authority as himself. He, is the, he has the final say and the final word. Of the uh, and the authority. Number three, Jesus thought uh, Jesus thought himself to be the center of the religious universe. He said, "I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. By me, if enter, uh, if any man enter in." He also said, "I am the door of the sheepfold." He that hateth not father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister, yea, even his own life also, taketh up his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Uh, pretty harsh words from this humble carpenter. But <clears throat> that's what Jesus had to say. Now, other things he thought, number four. He thought himself a denizen of eternity. He said, I saw Satan cast down. Before Abraham was, I am. He said that he was going to die, go back to heaven, prepare a place for us. Then he would return to receive us unto himself. He talked of heaven as if he was intimately familiar. His last prayer, which is actually the Lord's Prayer, is father i've come what you've sent me, i've done what you've sent me to do now restore me to the glory i had before uh, so he talked about eternity as if he's been there he, he's now on earth and now and then he's going back this is things that jesus thought about himself number five jesus said that he had to die as a ransom. <clears throat> he stated that something was wrong with the whole world, which could only be put right by his dying as a ransom. Now, the Jews knew what that meant. The kinsman redeemer had to have a, a uh, someone near of kin to redeem someone, uh, to ransom someone, also having to do with a... Uh, an animal that was not perfect. Um, there had to be a ransom paid in order to save that animal's life. So, but that he he said that some the things were wrong with the world and that he had to die as a ransom. And number six, Jesus said he claimed that he would raise from the dead seventy-two hours later after his death. People came and asking, asking Jesus for a sign. He said, the only sign would be given would be the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was in the uh, belly of the well for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. 72 hours. Now, people making claims like this, uh, you don't make saints out of people that claim things like this. And if he was a, a good and wise teacher, like scholars today would have us put him, uh, then the, the claims that he made about himself make it impossible for him to be both a good and wise teacher. If he was good, then he could honestly believe the things he claimed, but he wouldn't be wise for he would be incorrect. He could be wise knowing the claims that he were making were lies, but then he wouldn't be very good, would he? So if he was just a man, and truly not divine, the God-man the uh, that he was, uh, he had to or in, uh, that he had to be in order to kin himself to man, fulfilling God's requirements. Then the very words he spoke about himself demand that he could not be both good and wise. So what is the answer? C.S. Lewis came up with the answer. He called it a startling a startling alternate. Either this Jesus was a nut, a whacked out psycho, who led and is leading millions of people 
uh, astray by his lies, or he is who he claimed to be. Jesus the Christ, the first begotten of the Father, God himself, born into flesh, sent to die for the sin debt that humanity owes. This free gift of God that when accepted with childlike faith uh, will redeem us back to God's grace and his presence. Now, so who do we have here? Do we have some nut or psycho that's trying to deceive the world? Um, or even that he believes these things about himself, but he was just a psycho. He didn't, he didn't know he wasn't the son of God. He just thought he was. Um, or do we have the true son of God that had to die for the sins of the world? Uh, history is li literally that, his story. Uh, once you have no eyewitnesses to an event, uh, history becomes relative. It cannot be uh, proven. Anything in history that without the eyewitness, it cannot be uh, totally proven. Um, so then you have to look at other circumstantial evidence uh, to make a logical conclusion. And that's what we're doing with this study. Now, there are many theories uh, given over the, over the years and centuries uh, to explain the so-called resurrection of Christ. Now, the following reasons are most believable, and actually we'll find out that none of them are very believable, but except for one or, or except for two of them. But here are the theories. Number one, the, the disciples stole Jesus' body. Number two, the Jewish leaders stole Jesus' body. Number three, the Romans stole Jesus' body. Oops. Number four, the women went to the wrong tomb. Number five, hallucinations. They just thought they saw the resurrected Lord. Number six, he resuscitated. In the coolness of the tomb, he resuscitated. He didn't really die. But these are theories. Now, number five, or excuse me, number seven, the disciples lied. And the last one, number eight, the disciples told the truth. Now, you can look at all of those reasons and you come up with either two possibilities. Either the disciples lied or they told the truth as they knew it. So let's start and just and, and look at them. If the, the disciples stole the body, then there was no resurrection or ascension, so they were lying. Their first message preached was the empty tomb, uh, the resurrected Lord, and his ascension back into heaven. So if the disciples stole the body, then they're lying. At least part of their story is, story is lying. If the Jewish leaders stole the body, then by the very fact that their livelihood demanded that they would uh, present their evidence that Jesus had actually died. If the, if the uh, Jewish leaders stole the body, they had a lot to, dis to prove. Uh, that's why they had the seal put on the door and the guard put on the door, which was not actually a Roman guard, it would be the temple guard. Uh, and it's indicated that the when asked when they asked to put a guard on the door, uh, they were told, you have a guard, put the, your guard in front of the door. If the Romans uh, had their own guard there and the, those guards fell asleep, they would have been executed. Uh, but it, So it was the temple guard that was uh, guarding the tomb. But if the Jewish leader stole the body, uh, they would present the body to prove it, uh, prove the disciples wrong, and Christianity would not exist. If the Romans stole the body, then both uh, the Romans, by their own desire for quelling the story, and the Jews the, would have insisted that the Romans produce the body, thereby solving both of their problems, and Christianity would not exist. If the women went to the wrong tomb, 
<clears throat> then the uh, immediate solution for the interested parties, the, the Jewish leaders and the Romans, would be to show them the correct tomb. Christianity would not exist. If hallucinations were the, were the problem, then, then again, all you got to do is show the evidence, his body's there, Christianity would not exist. If he resuscitated, and by some chance of fate, he did not die at the Roman crucifixion, then the ascension would be a lie. The empty tomb would have been valid. The resurrected Lord, they could say he resurrected even though he just resuscitated. But they also, the first message was also that he ascended into heaven. So they're still telling a lie. Now, you're left with two alternatives. Either these poor disciples, leaderless and scared of the authorities, concocted this amazing tale of a Messiah dying for the world, yet surviving death itself and ascending back into God. And it's just that, it's just a lie. Or they actually experienced Jesus the Christ, God in flesh, beaten and crucified, dead and buried, yet miraculously cheating death, raising up from the dead, and in his glorified body, he hung out with him for 40 days and then ascended back into the heavens, which was witnessed by some 500 followers. So it's obvious now that either they were lying or they were telling the truth. Um, so how do you determine whether or not these disciples were lying or they were telling the truth. <laughs> there are four reasons uh, there are four reasons that I'm going to give you here which will prove that they were telling the truth. Number one there was a cataclysmic change for the better in all of the disciples. Each disciple of Jesus was changed. Doubting Thomas. Everywhere you go in, in Scripture, he's doubting. Jesus raised from the dead. I won't believe it till I put my fingers in his nail prints and in the, the hole in his side. Uh, he was changed. He took Christianity to India, never failing in faith again. James and John, called Sons of Thunder, uh, called down thunder on, on people they hated. Both of those miraculously changed and, and became the brothers of love. Unstable Peter, even after the resurrection, Jesus is a little bit uh, late in, in uh, showing up, so he says, I'm going fishing. Well, unstable Peter, he became the rock. Of course, he was the first one to deny, to deny the Lord uh, three times before the cock crows. Never again did he fail in his faith. All of Jesus' followers were positively affected. Now, a lie will change people. But seldom will it be in a positive manner. Lies almost always change people for the worse. Number two. There are internal consistencies within the Gospels that indicate the author's truthfulness. And I'm going to give you a few here. Mark, uh, who was sent to the Gentiles. We know he either... Uh, wrote in Egypt or in Rome, I think. But he was writing to Gentiles. And yet he calls Jesus the Son of Man more times than in any other gospel. Now, Mark is the shortest gospel, and yet he refers to Jesus as the Son of Man more than any other gospel. Now, <clears throat> if you're an Israelite, if you're a Jew, then that term, Son of Man, is a Messianic term. And they knew that. They knew the implication of, of the term son of man. But the Gentiles didn't know that. So if these people are telling a lie, 
Don't call him son of man. Call him son of God. You know, at least a few times. Um, but they didn't. So that indicates that he's being truthful. Um, also, uh, Peter took Mark under his wings. And, and Mark uh, was, was uh, Peter's protege. And yet, in Mark, uh, you have indications of Peter that make him look worse than in any other gospel. Why would you do that to your mentor? Unless you're telling the truth. Let's see. Uh, another reason, that why did they wait seven weeks before uh, preaching the first message? Doing that would only hurt their cause. Yet, because Jesus told them to wait, that's what they did. <clears throat> Another indication, when Jesus was feeding the 5,000 in John 6, uh, verse 5, why did he ask Philip where to buy the bread? Uh, in Luke, you find out that they were at Peseda. And then again, at the beginning of John, he says that Philip was from Bethsaida, so he would know where to buy bread. But these are just a couple of the uh, many qualities within the Gospels that indicate the truthfulness of the author. There are many things, but these are the uh, just a few that just that prove that these authors are being truthful in what they were saying. Now, number three. The price each disciple paid, each one dying a martyr's death except John. Each, each of uh, the disciples of Christ, horribly persecuted, dying a martyr's death. I'm going to give you a few of them. Paul was beheaded in Rome. Peter was crucified upside down. Mark was dragged to death in the streets of Alexandria. Thomas was pierced by a Brahmin sword in India. Bartholomew was skinned alive with a whip in Armenia. Andrew was crucified on what we now call the Andrew's cross, uh, a cross in the figure of an X. Luke was hanged by adulterous priests in Greece on an olive tree. So all of the disciples uh, suffered horribly, even a martyr's death, uh, save John. Now, number four, and this is the kicker, they all died alone, yet no one ever changed their story. Now, it's conceivable that a group of people sticking together for a lie in some kind of self-preservation uh, mode could hold out uh, for each other in telling this lie. What is totally impossible is that each disciple, separated by hundreds or thousands of miles, being tortured to death, yet not one, not one disciple ever changed their story. All they had to do was say, okay, I give up. It's a lie. You know, they're, they're separated from their brothers by hundreds or thousands of miles. There weren't phones. There weren't telegraphs or anything like that. Uh, their buddies ain't going to know that they they gave them up. They gave up this lie. But you'll never find one instance in all of history, not one instance where any disciple ever changed the story. What you see in these disciples are ordinary men when witnessing an extraordinary event that totally changed their lives. These men had to tell the story, this good news of the gospel. There was no way they couldn't do it. They had to shout it from the rooftops. The very first, uh, when they started preaching it, all the Jewish leaders told them to quit preaching Christ, quit preaching he raised from the dead. They couldn't do that. They had to do it because he did raise from the dead. No obstacle would prevent them from proclaiming this story. Now, it should be clear by now that Christianity did not begin with a lie, but a miracle. It was the most important event in the history of the world. 
Jesus came out of that tomb. Death itself was defeated. Now, just by simple faith in the completed work of Jesus, we can be certain that we have eternity. God's, God's nature is put into us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We no longer have to fear what lies behind that curtain of death. To the Christian, there is no more fear of death. If you've got Christ in you, if you know that he raised from the dead and you know that you're going to be raised from the dead, uh, the, the Bible says to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. As soon as you close your eyes in this life, you open them up there. This mortal beginning is all uh, we all go through is just a stepping stone. The road continues for those in Christ. But the road also continues if you're not in Christ. Its destination is unclear and separation from God is certain, which in itself is hell, regardless of the fire and brimstone that's promised to those who choose not to follow Christ. Our reward is sure, for Jesus did complete the task that God sent him to do. He set the captives free from the bonds of the law unto the spacious freedom of God's grace. When you know in your heart by study and confirmation of your own spirit that Jesus did defeat death and that he died and came out of that tomb, then your walk becomes more sure and living through the trials and troubles, turmoils, sadness, heartache, deaths, it becomes a little easier for we know that Jesus promised to us that he will raise us up as well. Uh, and that he will never leave us and forsake us. He will return to receive us unto himself, where we will be reunited. Now, this message is, is very important to all Christians. I don't claim to be able to, to speak anything you know, I'm not a uh, very uh, dramatic speaker. Maybe some people may even call me boring. I'm not Scott. You know, his, his hats and his cigars and his knowledge, man, he just blows you away. If I could share Scott's messages with the world, I would do every one of them. But I can't because somebody holds a copyright and someone does not want his messages being out there. But... This message, he said he wished everyone would plagiarize. So that's what we're doing. And also, all of his other messages uh, we're putting down into our own words. He taught, he taught us these things for years and years and years. And once you learn from someone and you go on and start teaching it, you're going to say phrases that he says you're gonna make comments that he made uh it's just it's just the nature of being a student and then becoming a teacher but scott the truths that dr gene scott taught us will live forever because i'm gonna keep teaching them and there are even hundreds of more students now spreading these same truths keep these things in mind rest assured that jesus did raise from the dead and that he will receive us back to himself. You all have a wonderful, blessed day, and we'll talk again.